Hello everyone, this is Dr. Flores and today I'm going to be talking about sociological research. So these are our learning objectives. I do not have all the time to go over everything, but I am again going to go over the hardest concepts to help you better understand. So as I mentioned in the last lecture, meta-analysis is a study of peer-reviewed articles that focus on a topic and a problem and so you analyze all these articles and you find the gaps between researchers and their data. A hypothesis is an educated guess. A variable is a factor, a component in your study that you will be so before you, you'll find the scientific methods, right? The scientific method is a the steps that a researcher has to undergo. Depending what kind of research you are, what textbook you're looking at, the scientific method includes seven or eight steps, right? Just depending. And I've even seen some scientific method steps that include like four or five, right? You just basically combine these steps, right? So on your own time, I want you to go ahead and if you're online, if you're in class, get into your groups and I need you to go ahead and apply these steps to a peer reviewed article. You're going to find a peer reviewed article and you're going to apply or identify the steps in the peer reviewed article as you basically select a topic, let's say you wanna focus on, because you're a social worker, let's focus on families, right? And let's say in families, you identify a problem, which is abuse as a social worker, that's a very common problem. Then step three would be looking up peer reviewed articles. All the peer reviewed articles focused on abuse in families, you would get them all within the last two to three years uh, because you need recent data, not data published in 1950s, right? Uh, and from that, you would read all of their findings, not the whole article, but the findings paragraph, and identify what they found and what they still haven't found, right? That's what a good researcher does. And from there, you create your own research study, which starts off with a hypothesis. Again, based on my lecture in the last chapter, uh, we are talking about an educated guess. What would be an educated guess based on the data that's still missing, that has not been analyzed and researched by other researchers? From there, you then go to step five and you identify as a researcher what research method you want to use. There's many, right? There's analysis of documents, which is secondary analysis, experiments, which includes the variables, independent variable, dependent variable. There is unobtrusive measures where you observe groups and individuals without letting them know so you don't bother them. Surveys, a piece of paper with questions on them. Participant observation, where you observe people while you are part of that group. Case studies, which could be an individual, a group, an institution that you want to study. That becomes your case. Secondary analysis, again, analysis of documents. It could also be analysis of police reports. It could be analysis of data already collected by the U.S. Census Bureau. The list goes on. So once you identify which research method you want to use, then you actually collect your data. You go out there and pass out the survey. You go out there and observe participants. That is what it entails to collect data. Seven, you analyze the results. You get your data, put it together, use a program, preferably. If not, you could do it by hand. SPSS is a program that analyzes data numbers uh, based on non-parametric and parametric analysis, whether the data is a random sample or not, right? You define which approach you want, which test to apply. And we have a program called Deduce. Other people like to use NVivo, but Deduce is very friendly, student friendly, to be honest with you. You could pick it up in one week, understand based on the videos that they have for you, how to use it and it analyzes qualitative data. And by now, based on the lecture in the last chapter, we should know what quantitative data is, which is what SPSS analyzes, and qualitative data is, which is what deduce analyzes, and deduce also analyzes quantitative data, but it's primarily used for qualitative data. Now, let's move on to step seven, oh, which is analyzing the data. Okay, I went over it. Now, let's move on to step eight. Once you analyze the data, you put it together, you write it up, you share it by publishing it or going to conferences and presenting on it. 
So go ahead and take the time to find that peer-reviewed article by going to the STC Library website. So you're going to go to southtexascollege.edu. You're going to scroll down to the library. And you're going to go ahead and type out, again, let's say you want to focus on family and abuse. You separate these two words with the word and. And please do not write a whole sentence on here because you will not find anything. Once you have all the results for three words, right, that, that would be ideal for the search engine. You want to only focus on peer-reviewed articles, so you click on limiters and you click on journal articles. And so all of these selections are now peer-reviewed articles. When you read a peer-reviewed article, let's say we want to read this one, you have to find a way to open the actual article. This is just the abstract, which is an appetizer for the main course. So it's a little paragraph telling you what the actual article is going to talk about. If you like it, find the button that actually say, let me read the entire article. So instead of reading all of this, just scroll down to the primary data, which is the conclusion, discussion paragraph, And this, here we go. So you could read this paragraph telling you what it was about. And this is where you find the findings data. This is primary data. So for this activity, you will have to scroll and find out what is the topic and problem, which you could find in the introduction. You will give me in one sentence what the literature review is about. And as you can tell, this, this paper does not have a literature review title but the entire introduction should include um, literature review. You can find literature review, ugh, excuse me, literature review data by looking at the citations. All these citations are referring to other peer-reviewed articles, which is part of a literature review. Then you need to find the research method, which should be here somewhere, convenience sample. I'm assuming that they did a survey. So I've selected survey participants So here in the data collection, instrument is referring to a survey. And so they use Likert scale, which is the um, ABC options, right? Uh, from a rate from one to two, whatever. So they did a survey. So that's your step five. If you could find a hypothesis on here, it's again, another when it should be in the methods paragraph here somewhere and sometimes they just type it out for you in the analysis part uh, because they need a hypothesis before they actually test it right so these are the focus of the research okay your quote-unquote hypothesis this is the analysis part i do not expect you to understand what the analysis is for any article that's too um high level for students in their first and second year in college. So instead of looking at the analysis, just go straight to the discussion or conclusion. And the discussion and conclusion, in layman's terms, they actually discuss what was found, right? And then for your step eight uh, reporting, you could just say, you know, uh, that it was published. That's how they reported their data, okay? So again, the assignment is you look up a peer-reviewed article, you identify all of these steps, and you learn what the scientific method is. And you learn that other researchers who publish peer-reviewed articles have to follow the scientific method. Okay? Okay, now let's talk about sociological research terms. In the last chapter, I talked about validity, which is measuring what we said we're measuring. Reliability, which is when we actually measure a variable, it actually produces the same results over and over again. A hypothesis, again, an educated guess. An independent variable, which is a variable that influences the dependent variable. And the dependent variable is the variable that changes based on the independent variable. And you could remember these terms by thinking independent person influences other people who are dependent, right? Same thing for these dependent variables and independent variables. So here is a good chart to help you remember. A hypothesis is an educated guess. So the hypothesis here would be the greater the availability of affordable housing, the lower the homeless rate. The greater the availability of math tutoring, the higher the math grades. The greater the police patrol presence, the safer the neighborhood. The greater the factory lighting, the higher the productivity. The greater the amount of observation, the higher the public awareness. 
So the independent variables, the variables that change, the dependent variable would be affordable housing, then it lowers homeless rates, which is dependent variable. Math tutoring increases math grades. Police patrol presence makes the neighborhood safer. Factory lighting increases productivity. Observations, more public awareness, right? So this is how a hypothesis should be written and each hy hypothesis has an independent and dependent variable. So now let's talk about the Hawthorne effect and the Rosenthal effect. The Hawthorne effect is when the behaviors are changed by subjects of a city, which is participants, because of their awareness of being observed, right? So when students or participants of a research study know that they're being watched, then they start behaving differently, right? When people watch wash my car, I like to stand right there in the window inside the uh, waiting room with the air condition, and I watch them watch my car Sorry, my Mexican accent doesn't allow me to say those words correctly. I watch them wash my car, and you could bet money that they're on their best behavior when they're washing my car because they see me watching them, right? So I get better results. The Rosenthal effect this is referring to a situation in which the researcher expects a certain outcome of their research study and because of this expectation, they actually affect the outcome because they're more inclined to observe certain things rather than other things. So they're more subjective versus objective. Subjective is when you have a bias, right? Objective is when you know you have a bias, but you watch for your bias so that you could observe fairly, right? So here I created or I included a comic strip of a researcher trying to interview individuals and their homes and he's asked uh, a question, right, an opinion from this individual in the doorway and after he responds, the researcher says, that's the worst set of opinions I've ever heard in my entire life, okay, based on this comic strip. What do you think is happening here, the Hawthorne effect or the Rosenthal effect? Is the researcher manipulating the situation? Is he changing the outcome of the research study based on his expectations? Or is the participant altering his behavior because he knows he's being observed? In this case, I would actually have to say it's a Rosenthal effect because he obviously wants a different response. So he's actually flat out telling him, no, no, that's not what you're supposed to be saying because my expectations of the outcome was the opposite of what you said, right? So he's influencing the research study by being very opinionated, the Rosenthal effect. So now let's watch this video and you tell me if you see the Rosenthal effect or the Hawthorne effect in this video. I believe that good sportsmanship and honesty are more important than just about anything when it comes to sports. So I took it upon myself to share that lesson with the next generation of professional athletes, kids, by hooking them up to a fake lie detector and driving them crazy. And here's how that went. <laughs> Well, hello. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you for coming. I'm Officer Jimmy. This is the Truth Fairy. The Truth Fairy is going to hook you up to a machine right now. Do you know what a lie detector is? Yeah. A lie detector is a machine that can tell if you're lying or telling the truth. So you must always tell the truth, okay? Okay. All right. And now we're going to put this on your head and we'll be all ready to go. Wow. That's right. He's got more gel than you, Truth yeah. Fairy. Yeah. yeah. Do you gel your hair? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, let's start with your name. What is your name? Blake. Okay, very good. How old are you, Blake? Seven years old. Seven years old. What grade are you in? First grade. Do you like school? Yeah. Do you like school? No. Yeah. Why don't you like it? 
I'm bad at science. You're bad at science? Yeah. You don't like science? No. It's boring? Yeah. What courses do you like? Math. You like math? Yeah. Okay. What's eight plus eight? Sixteen. Fourteen. <laughs> Have you ever peed in the swimming pool? A little bit. Hold on, let me ask the truth fairy. Truth fairy, have you ever peed in the swimming pool? Yes. You? Yes. Yeah. I think we all have. It's fun. It's great. Sometimes I stand up on the side and pee into the swimming pool. A lot of fun. Um, what do you like better, your mother or a puppy? My mother. Your mother? Why? Because she takes care of me. And puppies don't? No. Puppies only care about themselves? Yeah. Puppies are very selfish? Yeah. Do you hate puppies? No. Do you hate puppies? Do you feel like I could get you to say anything with this machine? No. Yes. Yeah. Who do you think is smarter, your mom or dad? Dad. Dad? Why is dad smarter? He knows way more history. He knows more history? Does your mom ever do dumb things? No. Does mom ever do dumb things? Yes. She does. What kinds of dumb things does she do? She says bad words. Oh, she says bad words. Like the really bad words? Yeah. Whoa. Do you ever say bad words? No. Sometimes? A little bit. A little bit with your friends? What are some of your favorite bad words? That's one of my favorites. <laughs> I don't know if we can continue with this. <laughs> okay, so based on our definitions of the Hawthorne effect and the Rosenthal effect, I'm hoping that everyone initially said that the researcher influenced the participants' reactions because of the hat. Um, and then eventually the participant realize that you know whatever the hat said he would need to agree with and so that you would see the Hawthorne effect there okay so let's talk about research methods research methods is the method that you use to collect the data right in this chapter we have about six some examples include surveys participant observation which is when you observe participants by being involved or not involved, right? Secondary analysis, when you study documents and data that was published by other people. Uh, documents, uh, it's secondary analysis, experiments, you, we talked about, you know, experiments and including independent variables and dependent variables and observing for the um, influence on the dependent variable. And we also talked about unobtrusive measures when we study um, groups without bothering them, right? So whenever we do a research study, we first need to identify a population, which is a large group located in a certain location. And from that population, you grab and create a sample. Usually 10% of the population would suffice. The individual is intended to represent the population. If you actually are able to gather a random sample, that means every nth number, uh, while giving everyone in the population an equal opportunity of being selected, that is a random sample, uh, then individuals who are willing to participate can be uh, the participants that are being observed. And participant observation would be including the researcher being involved with these groups, 
while unobtrusive measures does not include the researcher being involved. Ethnography is referring to, if you break it down, ethno, ethnicity, right, a group. Uh, graphy uh, would be talking about studying a group, right? So you could talk about prostitution and trying to find out what their culture is about. Uh, you could apply ethnography by uh, being overt or covert. I know individuals who play video games understand what these mean, but for those of you who don't, uh, think of it as overt being obvious and covert under the covers being hidden. Right? So you could do ethnography by being obvious or not obvious that you are studying individuals so that you could better understand their culture. So let's dig in deeper. Surveys. It's just basically questions found on a piece of paper and you could always do a pilot study to see that, uh, to see whether your questions in your survey are actually valid and reliable. Right? And we should already know what those terms mean. You hopefully should be objective doesn't matter what individuals respond, you should never be subjective and reacting to the responses. Sometimes there are certain topics such as child abuse that can bother every researcher, right? And it's a little harder to be objective. So in this case, researchers are recommended to use a double-blinded study where neither the researcher knows who the participant is and neither the participant knows who the researcher is, right? So an example would be a study conducted in a university and the professors sent out an invitation to students to answer a survey about child abuse. And the researchers were not located in the classroom Students attended the classroom at an individual time and day where no one would be in attendance and they would grab a survey that was located in the front of the classroom. They would answer the survey and they would submit it in a box without their names and no one knew who turned in what. And after that day and time has come and passed, the researcher came in, gathered the box of surveys and he analyzed the data. And he found that less than 10% of students who attended the university have thought of child abuse, have conducted child abuse, and if given the opportunity, would also commit child abuse. And in this case, we're talking about sexual abuse, okay? So obviously, these findings were very shocking. And if a researcher were to have been present, these findings would not have been documented because these are not um, facts that would easily be documented, especially because it's illegal, right? So this is why double-blinded studies do exist. Now, let's go into surveys and how some surveys have closed-ended questions and some surveys have open-ended questions. Now, open-ended questions obviously is a question that cannot exhaust the options. That means every option in the world cannot be listed in A, B, C, D format. For example, what is your name? What is your address? Right? Those cannot be listed as an option for every individual in existence. So it is better to use an open-ended question. Closed-ended questions provide options for individuals to respond to, but it must be exhaustive. That means you should have a option to respond that is related to every single individual in existence or who is participating. So the last option could be other and you could leave an open-ended blank uh, so that individuals could type out an option that was not listed for them. So experiments is when you have a control group and an in experimental group and in the experimental group you do want to uh, find or observe for the independent variable and how it influences the dependent variable. But the control group does the same steps or applies the same steps the experimental group applies without an actual or real independent variable, right? It is a, um, for example, a sugar pill. But the control group is told that they are part of the experiment without being exposed to uh, 
the truth that they are in the control group. So the measurements for both groups are analyzed to see if they're similar or different to identify if really the independent variable did impact um, the dependent variable. And one thing I wanted to point out is that it is wise to get participants. And once you get participants, each participant has an equal opportunity of being selected to go to the experimental group or control group. And that way, the differences that you find at the end of the study is not due to subjective assigning of the members to each of these groups. So two of the most famous studies that are out there when it comes to experiments is the Milgram study and the Stanford Prison Experiment. And they speak for themselves, so let me show you these videos. Would you give someone a deadly electric shock? Would you follow orders just to commit a violent crime against an innocent person if someone told you to? Or what about would you support an unjust cause just because someone told you to? People rarely see themselves as violent or capable of committing violent acts. They rarely see themselves on the wrong side of history. And yet, human history is full of violence, genocides, and atrocities. In fact, in today's world, you might even see friends and family now, people that you believe are good people, supporting violence. But how does this happen? Well, I'm going to tell you about an experiment in psychology that's set out to explain why people commit violence against others. And then I'm going to ask you these questions again. The true answers to these questions might surprise you. So, this study is called the Milgram Shock Study, also known as the Milgram Experiment. Its name comes from Stanley Milgram, the psychologist behind the study. So, Milgram was born in the 1930s in New York City to Jewish immigrant parents. As he grew up, he witnessed the atrocities of the Holocaust from thousands of miles away. How could people commit such atrocities? How could people see the horror in front of them and continue to participate in it? These questions followed him as he became a psychologist at Yale University. And in 1961, he decided to set up a study that might show how people follow orders from authority, even if it goes against their morals. So, how did the study work? Well, over the course of two years, Milgram recruited men to participate in a study. He created a few variations of the study, but in general, they involved a participant, a learner, and an experimenter. The participant acted as a teacher, reading out words to the learner. The learner would then have to repeat the words back to the participant. And if the learner got the words wrong, the teacher had to deliver an electric shock. Now these shocks increased in voltage. At first, the shocks were around 15 volts, just a mild sensation. But the shocks reached all the way up to 450 volts, which is actually extremely dangerous. Now, you must know, these shocks were not real. The learner was an actor who played along with the study, so people were not harmed in the study. The experimenter encouraged the participants to administer these shocks whenever the learner was incorrect. As the voltage increased, some participants resisted. In some variations of the study, the experimenter would urge the participants to administer the shocks. This happened in stages. Some participants were told to please continue, and eventually they had no choice but to continue. In some variations of the study, the actor would beg the participant not to administer the shocks, complaining of a heart problem. In some cases, the actor actually would even fake death once the highest voltages were reached. So you might be surprised to hear that this study even took place. There are obviously some ethical concerns behind asking participants to deliver dangerous electrical and even deadly shocks. The trauma of that study could impact the participants, some of whom did actually not learn the truth of the study for months after it was over. Maybe they thought they killed someone. But you might also be surprised to hear that a lot of participants did actually administer the most dangerous shocks. After the experiment was over, Milgram asked a group of his students how many participants they thought would deliver the highest shock. And the students predicted 3%. But in the most well-known variation of the study, a shocking 65% of participants reached the highest level of the shocks. And every single participant reached 300 volt levels. So the Milgram shock study took place over 50 years ago, and it's still considered one of the most controversial and infamous studies in modern history. The study even inspired TV movies. But not everyone praises Milgram for his boldness. The results of the study aren't particularly optimistic, and there have been critiques from psychologists over the years. After all, Milgram's selection of participants wasn't perfect. All of the participants were male, a group that only represents 50% of the population. Would the results be different if women were asked to deliver the electric shocks? Another factor to consider is that, like in the Stanford Prison Experiment, all of the participants answered a newspaper ad to participate in the study for money. Would the results have been different if the participants were not the type to volunteer for an unknown study? 
Other critics believe that documentation of Milgram's experiment suggests that some participants were coerced into completing the study. Psychologist Gina Perry believes that participants were even bullied into completing the study. Perry also believes that Milgram failed to tell the participants about the truth of the study. Rather than telling participants that a learner was an actor and shocks were never delivered, experimenters simply allowed participants to calm down after the study and then send them home. She believes many were never told the truth, and in that case, it's not very ethical, especially when their participation could have meant injuring another person. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about replications. Okay, so the point of this video was to basically understand why this research experiment was unethical. And if you came to the same conclusion that I did, that more harm is being done to participants than actual good when it comes to gathering the data to help our society or members of society, then it is considered unethical because we should be putting participants' uh, well-being first when it comes to researching and trying to gather data for the well-being of our community because the goal was to help our members of our community. So now let's go into the Stanford prison. If you go to Google and type in the word experiment, one of the first things you'll see is the Stanford prison experiment. It's probably the best known psychological study of all time. It all began in West Coast America on a summer's day back in 1971, when college students grew their hair long, protested against their government, were pro-peace and totally anti-authority. Or so we thought, until Philip Zimbardo. The Stanford Prison Study very simply is an attempt to see what happens when you put really good people in a bad place. We put an ad in the city newspaper, wanted students for study of prison life, lasting up to two weeks. We're going to pay you $15 a day. This is back in 1971. It's pretty good money. And we picked 75 volunteers, gave them a battery of psychological tests, and we picked two dozen who in all dimensions were normal and healthy to begin with. And then we did what is critical for all research. We randomly assigned half of them to the role of playing guards or the role of playing prisoners. It's a, literally like flipping a coin. And then what we did is we told the guards come down a day early and we had them pick their own uniform. We had them help set up the prison so they'd feel like it was their prison and the, and the prisoners were coming into their place. The prisoners, we simply said, wait at home or in the dormitories. Well, what we didn't tell them, which is a little bit of the deception of omission, is that they were arrested by the city police. Right there, they, you know, they took me out the door, they put my hands against the um, car. It was a real cop car, it was a real policeman. They took me to the, to the police station, the basement of the police station. Uh, I had told the policeman to put a blindfold on the prisoners, but since they had never been arrested, they didn't know that doesn't happen. The reason for the blindfold is then my assistants would come, put him in our car, bring him down to our prison, and they'd be in our prison now, blindfolded. The guards would strip them naked, uh, de-louse them, pretending that they were lice. It's kind of a degradation ritual. And after the first day, I was about to end it because nothing was happening. But the next day, on the morning of the next day, the prisoners rebelled. And what the guards did, they came to me and said, the prison's rebelling, what are we going to do? I said, it's your prison. Whatever you want, I will do it, but you've got to tell me. And they said, we have to treat force with force. So they broke down the doors. Stripped the prisoners naked, dragged them out. Some of them, they tied up their feet. They put them in solitary confinement, which was a tiny little hole uh, in a closet um, uh, about, about this big, uh, dark, uh, and, and they said, at this point, everything but breathing air is a privilege. Food is a privilege, clothes are a privilege, having a bed is a privilege. And so the guards began to say, here are the new rules. And the new rules are, you are dangerous and we are going to treat you as such. And then it began to escalate. Each day, the level of um, abuse, aggression, violence against prisoners got more and more extreme. And so the guards changed to become more dominant 
And you see, it's all about power. It's the whole institution that, that empowers the guards who are the representative of this institution called prison to do whatever is necessary to prevent prisoners from escaping, maintain law and order. Keep going. Once I was blind, but now I see. The way the direction it took is having them engage in ever more humiliating tasks, cleaning toilet bowls out with their bare hands, taking their blankets and putting them in dirt and net with nettles. And the prison had spent hours taking the nettles out if they wanted to, you know, sleep. And it's essentially saying we have the power to create a totally arbitrary, mindless environment. And that's the environment you have to live in. So some of the prisoners are now crushed. And in 36 hours, the first kid has an emotional breakdown, meaning crying, screaming, irrational thinking. I gotta go. I can to a doctor, anything. No, no, no! No, no, no! God damn it! And we have to release him. In five days, we had to release five of the prisoners because the situation was so overwhelming. What about the kids who didn't, who didn't break down? They became zombies. Zombies in the sense that they became almost all mindlessly obedient. Whatever the guards would say, they did. Do this, they did. Do 10 push-ups, do 20 push-ups. Step on him while he's doing push-up. Uh, tell him he's a bastard. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. It was, hor it was horrifying to see the kids break down. It was even more horrifying to see these other, these other kids just become mindlessly obedient. What a prisoner 819 did. Mike that. Because of what prisoner 819 did, my is a mess. Again, we have to keep remembering, these are kids who start out being rebels against society, all, every one of them, and now they are just pawns. They are, they are, they are the puppets that, that the guards are uh, manipulating. In fact, one of the guards uh, said uh, it was like being a puppeteer. The guards tested their control over the prisoners by making them write a letter home. No need to visit your seventh heaven. Yours truly. Yours truly. Your loving son. Your loving son. And put the name there that your mother gave you. The results were surprising because we, I did not expect the transformation of good kids into pathological prisoners or abusing guards to occur so quickly and so extremely. That is, we had assumed from all other research, you know, that there would be verbal abuse, they would make fun of them, there would be teasing, there would be bullying. But not this kind of, I would call it creative evil. That is, thinking about ways to demean, degrade, dehumanize other human beings. And the critical thing there in that transformation is becoming the role or the role becoming you, and, su and suspending your usual morality, your usual way of thinking. You really become that person, what you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick, and, you know, you, you act the part. So what Zimbardo's research demonstrates so dramatically is that situations can affect us more than we think, and can often outweigh individual characteristics. So again, the Stanford prison experiment was an experiment that was unethical because as you saw, um, it was harming emotionally and psychologically the prisoners. Uh, and he, in other videos, expresses how he stopped the experiment only because another faculty member who observed the effects on the students pointed out to him that that was unethical and what he was doing to students was unethical and wrong. And that's the only reason he stopped the experiment. So again, it just begs the question, what is being done to maintain ethical standards for participants who are willing to participate in research experiments? So with that, we have the uh, IRB, the um, Institutional Review Board. And so the IRB basically evaluates every single research study to make sure that ethical standards are being implemented and will be maintained throughout the entire research study. So more research methods. The secondary data analysis is talking about analyzing 
existing sources such as peer-reviewed articles, data sets on the U.S. Census Bureau website, books, reports, newspapers, uh, police reports, records, crime victims' compensation forms, experiments. And here's the link to uh, U.S. Census data. So this is what that looks like. As you could see, uh, we have data for all these populations. And we have percentages associated with them and we can manipulate this. This is data referring to the year 2021. And if we wanted to, we could grab this data, analyze it and publish it. So there is a code of ethics, as I mentioned earlier. Should researchers be responsible, responsible for participants' well-being or gather important information? And the answer is yes. So let's watch a couple of these videos so that you can understand the importance of maintaining ethical standards. In the 1930s, In the, 1930s the, United the United States was States ravaged by syphilis. The sexually transmitted infection afflicted nearly 1 in 10 Americans, producing painful sores and rashes that persisted for roughly two years. After these initial symptoms, late-stage syphilis was known to cause organ damage, heart and brain disorders, and even blindness. It was incredibly difficult to slow the disease's spread. Experts cautioned against unprotected sex, but the infection could also be passed during childbirth. Worse still, Existing treatments like mercury and bismuth were considered unreliable at best and potentially harmful at worst. Today, these heavy metals are classified as toxic, but at the time, doctors were still uncovering their dangerous side effects. Amidst the uncertainty, healthcare professionals had two key questions. Did late-stage syphilis warrant the risks of existing treatments? And did the infected individual's race change how the disease progressed? Many physicians were convinced syphilis affected the neurological systems of white patients and the cardiovascular systems of black patients. There was little evidence for this theory, but the U.S. Public Health Service was determined to investigate further. In 1932, they launched a massive experiment in Tuskegee, Alabama. The town had already possessed a small hospital, and the area was home to a large population of potential participants. The PHS collaborated with local doctors and nurses to recruit roughly 400 black men presumed to have non-contagious late-stage syphilis, as well as 200 non-syphilitic black men for their control group. But their recruitment plan centered on a lie. While the researchers planned to observe how syphilis would progress with minimal treatment, participants were told they would receive free drugs and care for their condition. At first, researchers gave the men existing treatments, but these were soon replaced with placebos. Under the false pretense of providing a special remedy, researchers performed painful and invasive spinal taps to investigate the disease's neurological consequences. When patients died, the PHS would swoop in to study the body by funding funerals in exchange for autopsies. In their published studies, they listed the men as volunteers to obscure the circumstances under which they'd been recruited. Outside Alabama, syphilis treatment was advancing. A decade after the study began, Clinical trials confirmed that penicillin effectively cured the disease in its early stages. But in Tuskegee, researchers were determined to keep pursuing what they considered vital research. They had yet to confirm their theories about racial difference, and they believed they would never have another opportunity to observe the long-term effects of untreated syphilis. The study's leadership decided to withhold knowledge of new treatments from their subjects. During World War II, researchers convinced the local draft board to exempt men from their study preventing them from enlisting and potentially accessing penicillin. The study even continued through the 1950s when penicillin was shown to help manage late-stage syphilis. By today's bioethical standards, withholding treatment in a research study without a patient's informed consent is morally abhorrent. But for a large part of the 20th century, this practice was not uncommon. In the 1940s, US-led studies in Guatemala infected numerous prisoners, sex workers, soldiers, and mental health patients with sexually transmitted infections to study potential treatments. And other studies throughout the 50s and 60s saw doctors secretly infecting patients with viral hepatitis and even cancer cells. Eventually, researchers began objecting to these unjust experiments. 
In the late 1960s, an STI contact tracer named Peter Buxton convinced the PHS to consider ending the study. But after leadership decided against it, Buxton sent his concerns to the press. In July of 1972, an expose of the Tuskegee study made headlines across the country. Following public outcry, a federal investigation, and a lawsuit, the study was finally shut down in 1972, 40 years after it began, and 30 after a treatment for syphilis had been found. No evidence of any racial difference was discovered. 74 of the original 600 men were alive. 40 of their wives and 19 of their children had contracted syphilis, presumably from their husbands and fathers. In the wake of this tragedy and concerns about similar experiments, Congress passed new regulations for ethical research and informed consent. But systemic racism continues to permeate medical care and research throughout the U.S. To truly address these issues, the need for structural change, better access to care, and transparency in research remains urgent. For all too real horrors. Welcome to Watch Mojo's Top 5 Facts. In today's installment, we'll be counting down the top five disturbing facts about Nazi experiments. Before we begin, we publish new videos every day. Into the atrocities committed by the Third Reich, we'll be exploring the evil lengths to which Nazi Germany went in their inhumane scientific endeavors. They were gassed, shot, hanged, and then burned. Men, women, children, babies. Number five, they used prisoners for incendiary bomb research. Everyone deserves what he gets. These words will never, ever leave my memory. The concentration camps operated by the Nazis will forever be remembered as one of the most shameful displays of human cruelty in history. Starvation, forced labor, physical abuse, and the risk of execution were all daily realities in the camps. But at Buchenwald, prisoners were also used as guinea pigs for research. Among the most notorious were the incendiary experiments carried out between 1943 and 1944. These experiments involved intentionally exposing prisoners to severe white phosphorus burns in order to better understand the nature of the wounds caused by incendiary bombs, as well as evaluate their effectiveness of various treatments. White phosphorus, if you're wondering, results in chemical burns capable of eating down to the bone. Number four, they conducted survival experiments. Uh, on the average, we would dispatch 2,000 people a day. There will always be those who seek to push the human body to its limits, like real-life Iceman Wim Hof, who trained himself to survive extreme cold. The key distinction here is that he willfully subjected his body to such trials. Testing the resilience of a human body without consent, however, is torture, and that's just what the Nazis did. In Dachau, the scientists purposefully froze Jewish and Russian prisoners to the point where they passed out or died to better educate themselves on cold weather before pushing the Eastern Front. They also studied the effects of being at high altitudes using pressure chambers, as well as trying to make seawater drinkable, both of which reportedly killed most subjects. Number three, prisoners were intentionally exposed to disease. They performed experiments, painful often, on the children. Uh, consigned to death. Why would they do such a thing? Well, scientists of the Third Reich clearly weren't exactly concerned with their morality or ethics and saw their prisoner populations as opportunities to study infectious illnesses in a controlled environment in order to develop treatments. The various experiments were carried out in both the aforementioned Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camps, as well as Sachsenhausen, Natzweiler, and Neuengamme. To be clear, they weren't interested in finding a cure for the common cold. The inoculations included such deadly diseases as epidemic jaundice or infectious hepatitis, tuberculosis, malaria, typhoid fever, yellow fever and typhus, and unsurprisingly claimed countless lives. Number 2. Dr. Mengele and the Terror of Twins If there's one evil Nazi scientist whose name has etched its way into the mainstream, it's Dr. Josef Mengele. An SS officer, Mengele was one of the leading medical minds of the Third Reich. After having requested a transfer to a concentration camp, Mengele took up his post as chief physician of Auschwitz, where he sent thousands of prisoners to their death in the gas chambers. It was here that he performed his inhumane genetic experiments, including his research on twins. Amputations, intentional introduction of disease, and unnecessary blood transfusions were all just a few of the techniques he employed, and he reportedly even sewed two twins together. He was never captured. Miriam would have been taken immediately to Mengele's lab, killed with a phenol injection to the heart, and then Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies. Number one, they tried to prove Jewish inferiority with the Jewish skeleton collection. 
Though the Nazi concept of purity led them to persecute many groups, including the disabled, homosexuals, people of color, Slavics, Roma gypsies, and more, the Jews were the primary target. So strong were the anti-Semitic views that an anatomist at the Reich University of Strasbourg, August Hurt, actually developed a project known as the Jewish Skeleton Collection in order to scientifically validate the eugenic effort of the regime. The collection claimed 115 victims, most of whom were selected for their stereotypically Jewish features, of which 86 were chosen to serve as part of the finished collection. The bodies were to be dissected, studied, and ultimately preserved as skeletons, but thankfully the course of the war changed and Hurt committed suicide before he and his colleagues could complete their gruesome work. Last video, guys, the tea room study. My name is Jessica Chastine, and today I'm going to present the tea room trade, an ethnographic case study by Laud Humphreys. First, let's meet Laud Humphreys. Humphreys' background includes work as a priest, mental health counselor, researcher, and voyeur. As a priest, Humphreys worked for 10 years in a section of Chicago known as Queen Parish for its large population of homosexual males and drag queens. Then, in the 1950s, Humphreys worked in a psychiatric hospital and learned about the use of psychoanalysis for male homosexuality, which at the time was considered a mental health disorder. However, Humphreys reports that he was not interested in trying to reform homosexual behaviors, but rather to study them. So he began his work as a researcher. The following is a passage from page 16 in the Tea Room Trade, and it illustrates how Humphreys chose the context for his study. In the summer of 1965, I wrote a research paper on the subject of homosexuality. After reading the paper, my graduate advisor raised a question, the answer to which was not available from my data or from the literature on sexual deviance. But where does the average guy go just to get a blowjob? That's where you should do your research. I suspected that the answer was to the tea rooms, but this was little more than a hunch. In 1965, in Los Angeles, supposed homosexual behavior was a felony charge under the law. In a four-year period, Los Angeles convicted 493 men of this supposed crime, and 56% of those were arrested in public restrooms known as tea rooms. For his study, Humphreys chose to examine these tea rooms and observe the homoerotic behaviors within. To provide consistency in his research, he focused his sights to only public restrooms with a specific floor plan a 1930s-style building particularly suited to sexually deviant behavior due to location, window placement, and privacy. Humphreys provided a diagram, which you can see here. Once Humphreys established the context of his study, he described his data collection procedures, including systematic observations, interviews, archival data, and questionnaires. Humphreys himself performed 50 observations of homoerotic encounters that were included in the study, and he also had a respondent observer make 30 observations, and he compared the field notes of both. Field notes were structured as shown in the diagram to provide consistency. Humphreys also interviewed 12 of the 50 participants in depth, calling them the intensive dozen. He used license plate numbers and connections with the police department to access demographic, employment, and contact information of other tea room participants, and use that information to distribute and collect men's health questionnaires to tea room frequenters. Through his observations and other data collection, Humphreys identified four types of participants in the tea rooms. Type one were called trade, type two, ambisexuals, type three, gays, and type four, closet queens. The trade type included 19 individuals whose primary function in the tea rooms was prostitution, trading sexual acts for money. Many of the trade were truck drivers, teenage boys involved in gang activity, and semi-skilled workers. Type two, the ambisexuals included 12 individuals who were primarily suburbanite husbands commuting to or from work, stopping by the tea rooms for impersonal sex on their way home to their wives. Type three, as Humphreys called the gays, included seven of the 50 participants. Many of these participants were openly gay in the community and several expressed hopes of gaining a permanent partner through a tea room tryst. Type four, the closet queens, were comprised of 12 men, mostly single and Catholic, who were primarily interested in teenage boys. Humphreys described all of them as people next door, people who would never have been pegged as sexual deviance. Some of the themes that Humphreys noted were the rules and roles of tea room participants, the patterns of action within tea room encounters, and the risk of participation in tea room activity. He described a breastplate of righteousness phenomenon among participants in which those participants who were most concerned with hiding their homoerotic behaviors were also the most politically conservative when matched with demographically similar controls. Humphreys concluded that the tendency to be orthodox, proper, and politically conservative 
was an attempt to compensate for sexually deviant, deviant behaviors in these participants. Another theme that Humphreys noted hit on why tea room encounters were happening, and the answer was mostly for kicks and also for sex without commitment. In this section, Humphreys contended that attempted social control of homoerotic behaviors was actually more harmful than helpful and that lifting taboos surrounding homosexuality would allow participants to increase self-esteem, decrease cognitive dissonance, and perhaps lessen the possibility of participants becoming any kind of threat or danger to the community. The key feature of this classic case study are the roles of the researcher, the ethics of the case, and the taboo of the subject. Humphrey's role as a researcher was as a participant observer. He acted as a voyeur, observing the sexual encounters as if he was waiting on a sexual partner. Humphreys also acted as a watch queen, someone who walked from one window to the other while others were engaged in sexual activity, coughing or tapping his foot to warn of approaching intruders. Ethically, Humphreys obtained official consent only from participants who agreed to be known by the researcher, also known as those who would speak with him outside the tea room observation area. He contends that since the tea rooms were public spaces, he was practicing disguised observations as outlined by Erickson in 1967 and protecting his unknown participants through anonymity. However, in a retrospective essay included in his 1970 text, Humphreys does admit that t tracing license plates was ethically questionable and somewhat regrettable. Lastly, this study became a classic in some respects because of the taboo and controversy surrounding the subject matter. Humphreys confirmed that more than half of participants involved in the tea room trade were heterosexual, at least outwardly, and married to women. Because of the taboo, Humphreys deceived some participants by call, calling his surveys and subsequent in-home interviews men's health questionnaires. But deception can be used ethically in sociology when it protects the reputation of participants, which Humphreys argued in defense to his critics. If you'd like to learn... So unfortunately for us, initially, studies such as the syphilis study, the studies on Jews, and the tea room study were unethical because... The goal of a researcher is to maintain the good health of the participants, the reputation of the participants, especially when you do not have their consent to study them, and um, the well-being of the participant overall, right? So please keep these studies in mind when it comes to ethical standards of research studies. So in this chapter, we talked about the scientific method, research methods, and most of all, the ethical standards that every researcher and research study should apply.